Yeah, first of all, um, many thanks for the invitation. I was supposed to be in Singapore, and we managed to join with this raw, raw side conference that I think is a super good opportunity uh, to tell, tell you a bit about what I've done in uh, software development, although uh, there's a caveat. Um, I think I haven't touched a piece of code since um, probably 10 years um, after taking a series of different positions and eventually becoming the CEO of the Italian Institute of Technology, which doesn't allow definitely to do any robotics. So myself, I'll be telling you um, about the research, about the people. Uh, I think it's sometimes it's normal, but I, I wanted to let you know that um, I had to actually talk to my researchers and discuss, and, and they told me what to say, basically, and how to present <laughs> this uh, work that they developed in the last few years. Although, so I wanted to acknowledge these three people that are the great developers that are allowed to do the stuff that I'm gonna show you. Uh, the other thing that is important, although in the past I was myself a, a, a software developer and I worked with a variety of robot platform, so I actually initiated this piece of work that I'm gonna show. Um, but then as any project that is moderately successful got uh, a soul on itself and uh, developed outside my control. So anyway, I wanted to go back to the time when I started. Um, this was the reasoning we were having. It was um, at this specific time I was at MIT working with some of the students there and we were wondering what to do, how to make sure we're not going to re-implement the inverse kinematics once, twice, three times, and forever. So, um, of course, uh, writing software was a, very, a lot more difficult, I would say, at that time. Um, I mean, our ambitions, I guess, were a bit lower. The inverse kinematics was, you know, already quite of a challenge. Um, and unfortunately, because there were a lot of students in the project, uh, the single, um, software tended to die very quickly. And um, so first time I actually um, arrived in the lab and I asked, okay, is there any platform that I can use? They said, oh, uh, yeah, there are this bunch of executables. Um, yeah, figure out how to do anything with them. So um, we, uh, me and another student sat there and decided to scrap the entire system um, and rewrite the code, um, and at that time we, we started thinking about component, componentization. And, um, and the operating system of choice was QNX. So if you remember QNX, you're lucky enough. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite cool because it allowed certain real-time features and computer-to-computer -computer communication. And uh, bear with me with Pentium uh, 3, 800 megahertz, um, to do image processing required a lot of computers to be uh, connected in a, in a reasonable, um, per reasonably performing network. Anyway, um, the, uh, this is to, to, to let you know where I started. Um, so that there, uh, at that time there wasn't, um, we had different robots, there wasn't much of a sharing of software um, these are the names of the robots popular in 2001. You may remember some of them. It was, um, it was quite, quite an interesting period. I remember also um, we had a workshop with, uh, there was uh, Morgan uh, Quigley, uh, there were the people developing um, uh, the Microsoft Robotics Studio, uh, a bunch of other people doing middlewares, and uh, that was the moment where we were all, were all playing with this concept of having components and reusing components and figuring out protocols to make the components talk to each other. So this is when uh, we developed our own uh, middleware. It was called yet another robot platform because it, it wasn't the first one, I must say. Um, and we made it open source mostly because after working with these people at MIT, I went back to Italy and I needed a way to collaborate with people. And the best possible choice was, okay, let's make it open source, have on a whatever SourceForge repository at that time, then it became GitHub, um, and have a software that we can continue developing across the ocean. 
And uh, I think it was a, a, a good experience and um, it led eventually to the concept that for robotics you need something um, that, that didn't exist uh, at the time. Our philosophy was, first of all, that one processor is never enough because this is uh, what I said, we needed many computers to work on, uh, on uh, or to make reasonable experiments with the robots that we had, modularity, minimal interference, uh, separation of the communication and, and the algorithms that are doing the computation, um, wanted to stop suffering because <laughs> that was uh, the feeling we had every time we started a new project on a new robot, we had to rewrite the software from scratch. And we managed, I think, to port the code um, for, on different platforms well enough that eventually it, it worked well. We also wanted to exploit the diversity in the following sense. Um, we wanted to be able to run um, the same code on Windows or on Linux in such a way that we um, could reuse, for instance, on the robot that uh, we had there, I needed a um, software for speech recognition that wasn't available um, on, on QNX for sure. There wasn't nothing running there. Um, and um, and so possibility of communication across different platforms was important. Eventually we ended up um, using um, the adaptive communication environment, ACE, a library uh, to wrap most of the operating system uh, primitives in such a way that we could port across the different architectures. Anyway, um, and this is um, exactly what it ended up being um, in uh, at least the first implementation, but also the second one. Uh, I think nowadays people manage to get rid of um, the ACE and they're using something else, but it uh, doesn't matter. The concept will remain, uh, I think, partially the same. Um, anyway, um, this is basically, uh, at least from my perspective, the history of uh, the publisher subscriber um, architecture that was eventually ended up being very, very similar on ROS. On, I guess ROS2. Uh, uh, the Microsoft one wasn't entirely compatible, I must say. It was uh, RPC based, uh, very not entirely what we had in mind when designing a control system where you wanted to be streaming as much as possible. And um, yeah, if you miss a message, it doesn't matter because you're continuously streaming. This was the initial idea we were pursuing. Also, because on QNX, you never missed a message. It was guaranteed to be real time. Um, anyway, the, this was a um, bit of history. I just wanted to tell you where I started from. Eventually, um, after I finished my postdoc at MIT, I went back to Italy uh, because of a European grant that allowed me to design this robot. Um, so I received enough money to pay people for five years um, and uh, design the, the mechanics, electronics, and the software for this robot. And at that point, we reused uh, YARP, which was uh, what came from MIT running on COG and Kismet and the other robots there. Um, I have this logo here of the uh, racing team from Ferrari, not because the robot is very fast, but because the robot is like a Formula One car. It breaks every uh, race. Okay, so it runs and you do one experiment and then you spend most of your time fixing fixing the robot. It's a tendon driven, mostly tendon driven robot. So you can imagine what, um, what you have to do uh, or what happens quite often. Um, you snap a cable and you have to go there uh, fixing it. It's uh, quite of a challenge. Um, it's also one of the few robots that are complete. These are tactile sensors, capacity tactile sensors, I think was still one of the few robots worldwide which has a complete tactile coverage, which is nice and useful for experiments on human-robot interaction, which is what we pretty much do in uh, these days. But I'm gonna show you also some additional stuff. Let me tell you about additional features that we implemented in YARP, but they turn out to be useful for some of the tasks that I'm gonna show you um, in a moment. Uh, one was um, um, concept of channel prioritization. So here, we basically uh, playing with the uh, QoS of the network switches and also uh, with the, uh, let's say, thread prioritization in the communication classes that are 
actually then um, uh, generating or being the code that um, uh, makes communication possible. Um, and this um, turns out to be um, useful. Um, also because, I mean, you can reduce um, uh, the delay, but also you can make sure you have a smaller jitter and therefore your control system, um, you can tune better your control system, you have uh, higher gains, so, I mean, I, don't, I guess I don't have to tell you the story of basic controllers. But uh, this is a, was, I think, an important feature to um, be able to control uh, how we play with the communication channels at the low level. So having an interface where I can set all the parameters that are related to communication. The other thing that we've done um, because, um, well, because of ROS actually, um, we wanted, uh, we developed our middleware and then ROS was a great success. And we said, oh gosh, now what do we do? We overhauled the entire software base to something else that was by that time million lines of code. Uh, we said maybe we, yeah, we have a plugin and the plugin is actually a DLL um, whereby all the carriers in the system are DLLs. So if I load the ROS DLL, I'm happily speaking the ROS protocol. So initially we tried to hack into the code and make uh, you know, our own protocols completely compatible with ROS, but it was seriously painful with the concept of um, dynamic load libraries. Uh, yeah, it's a lot easier. You just develop the DLL and you plug it in and it can happen dynamically at runtime. So what happens, in fact, that we have uh, a carrier that is um, an MJPEG. You know, these webcams that are everywhere worldwide. Yeah, you just connect and um, stream images, and you see the images uh, they decompressed in the whatever, vis visualizable format. Um, anyway, um, and, and therefore, we were able to do a ROS um, basically compa complete compatibility in that way. It's not enough because of course we have a name server and then you have to make name servers talk to each other and synchronize all the names and IP addresses and stuff. So what we've done along the way here was, and I'll show you later, we made, more recently we had took a different route, uh, which is uh, we taken our main interface and made a completely ROS compatible. So the robot will be speaking ROS directly, uh, which uh, allows for, uh, I'll show you uh, in a moment. Uh, one uh, last but not least, this is um, a piece of work that we made for a company. They wanted to use our middleware, um, uh, mostly because we, since it was our code, we could um, reconfigure in a license that was not open source because the company didn't like the open source. Um, we had a long discussion on how to figure, to make it work for them, uh, given the initial open source re release of our code. But anyway, um, and we did a um, uh, shared memory protocol for them uh, to be able to run um, at maximum speed when, when the different processes are on the same machine. And this is a comparison of performance uh, for different packet sizes and, uh, this is, I think, eventually, it's not even shared memory, it's probably Unix queues or something like that that are, um, turn out to be extremely efficient. And we have a number of different implementations because, of course, the code that we gave to a company cannot be reused, reused by us, even by us. <laughs> so we, we went for a number of different things, but uh, apparently everything that uses eventually shared memory is equally efficient. I mean, the overheads are minimal, so that, that was, I don't Another thing we've done. Um, we were so happy with the um, DLL idea that we made also um, um, uh, not a pos the possibility of loading at runtime uh, a piece of Lua uh, code to um, implement uh, something called the port monitor. Port monitor is a way to sniff into the communication channel. You can do it bi-directionally, so um, if a return messages can be sniffed, and you can do things like well, filter messages, uh, I mean, that's trivial, uh, log um, at a very 
low level because this will log everything and also compress images if you want. So you plug a um, compressor there or a decoder and why not? I mean, it turned out to be useful. Um, you can monitor the timing of messages and this is um, something that is just before the communication channel. So again, it's, it's very efficient and it's scripting language basically that is plugged into the communication port, which turned out to, to be useful for um, another application that I'm gonna show in a moment. Last but not least, we wanted to make sure um, once we develop, uh, for instance, dev device drivers to, to talk to the hardware that we could um, remotize those because sure, one computer is never enough so the PC that it may be controlling your robot is not where you like to be sending commands to, to the robot itself. So uh, one simple, again, nothing dramatically <laughs> new here was again to have a module um, and again modules that can be dynamically loaded that will remotize network wise um, the interfaces that are like, shown here. I, I mean, these trivialities. I mean, nowadays I don't think there's anything spectacular, but it works very well, in fact, because you have, no matter where you are, you sit there writing your control code and this, um, you use the same language, you call the same functions, you have the same classes. There's no difference if you're on the robot or remote with respect to the robot. Um, and this is exactly what allows now the robot being controlled either by the native, whatever, the original uh, ERP. So the, all the device drivers are interfaced to our middleware or ROS or ROS2 and it all works. I mean, it's, uh, this is easy um, because at this point, if someone is asking for ROS, I um, don't have to do anything. I just provide this piece of code. This is again, the DLL people will load at runtime and they use ROS and they don't bother me every second day with a bug in the translation of protocols. Um, uh, what else? Um, this was for, um, I said, the middleware part. This is another video that shows some, something slightly different but it's useful um, for, for later again. Um, so here was a problem on a finite state machine that was controlling switching on and off certain things. So behavior wasn't off and the robot fell as a result. Um, and this is because finite state machines are complicated to manage. So more recently, there's a trend to use something else that is called a behavior tree. Uh, this was this is used in NAV2, for instance, but it's used also in a bunch of other robots. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, this uh, has a certain advantage. Certain, certainly it's clean. Um, the way the formalism is working, uh, instead of being described by this one, where from each state you have to foresee every possible connection, every possible condition. Um, the behavior tree, if something fails, just it, it remains in a state that is consistent, but it, it doesn't get stuck. Um, so uh, the, the way it works is fairly simple, and this can actually be drawn in a CAD and compiled automatically. So that this, you can make it into, into code very easily. Um, the bare, behavior tree formalism has sequences, fallback, that is conditions basically, and parallel execution. Then there are other things. If you want to coordinate behavior, there are decorators, there are little um, synchronization messages that are needed to when you're running things in parallel. But otherwise, I mean, for the sequence, you don't need much more. I'll show you an example. This is uh, another student of ours that developed uh, this is um, sometime in the past, and this shows how the different behaviors are activated. Depending on the condition that becomes false, you execute one or the other. Here, um, someone was uh, playing with, uh, um, tricking the robot um, not to see the ball, and uh, you see that uh, whenever it misses the condition, actually goes back to the original behavior and never 
and get stuck from that. Um, we did the same with one of our robots, um, uh, partially humanoid, um, and here, by the way, is using ROS to navigate. We never develop any navigation code. Um, we always reuse what was available, open source. And this is um, a combination of a reasonable number of behaviors. They send the robot um, across the room, recognize the person, talk to the person, or, you know, between quotes, <laughs> say, changes a few messages and go for uh, finding an object and crafting the object. Um, now, there's um, another level that has to be developed before we can go in more serious application. Again, with um, if we just go too naively, we have a number of levels where um, the, uh, you know things may, may become complicated just because we start developing different behaviors. We don't think of how to organize them, and it may get confused. And again, we fall back into the final state machine type of thing. So. What we wanted to do was to organize things, and in, a, in fact, what we have, although this is represented as um, a finite state machine, can be implemented also uh, as a behavior tree, but this is very, very simple. It's just to show, uh, for instance, what it, what it means to be grasping for schematics, move, and, and the factor pose, close hand, whatever. Um, the behavior tree sits on top. It organizes the general behavior of the robot, and here, down here for each primitive action, you actually have uh, low level implementation. So moving the joints, doing whatever is needed to be done. Um, also, we can monitor these channels of communication and we can check that everything is going well. This is important if you deploy an application that is large enough and there, there can be additional uh, checks to be made uh, just to make sure, I don't know, battery is okay or uh, the 5G is connected and so forth. Um, so in fact, we took, took all this stuff, put together and um, in a, an application which is Robotic Museum Guide, which ran for two weeks in two real musea in, um, in Italy, the city of Turin. And um, the idea was to guide people through the museum uh, telling them what they were, they were seeing, recognizing them, um, having the robot move only when it's actually um, seeing people and, and so forth. Uh, the connectivity uh, to the robot was via 5G, which was tricky because we had to use a VPN. The VPN brought down the bandwidth to 30 megabits per second, which wasn't enough for the LiDAR to communicate to the modules outside the usual stuff. Um, but this was the, the architecture. Um, actually, it was 5G because, well, because it's nice because this was part of a European project called 5G Tour, uh, where the idea was to, to try different applications in relation to 5G, and robotics is clearly a nice one. Um, although they didn't think that a robot may need to upload and not only download, and this uh, bandwidth, um, what's it called? Uh, Asymmetry um, is not necessarily the best thing you want to see on a robot. Um, this is the result. Um, this is the um, advertisement version with nice music. The music was there at the museum, just to show you uh, what was happening. Uh, the stuff on the shoulder, on the um, upper arm of the robot, is the, actually the 5G, the 5G model, <laughs> or the, the 5G cell phone. Um, and and um, yeah, this um, just to give you an idea. The, there's more videos. Um, just to summarize what you, I showed you here, um, the port monitors. Um, so the, the ability to sniff in what the ports are doing were used actually here to monitor the overall behavior of the robot. The behavior tree is the general organization of the whole thing. Um, there are multiple middleware, although. I, I, show here the old diagram, the navigation is ROS, there are the modules. We also talk in the, uh, to the Google, API, via Google API to a speech recognition online, I mean, in the cloud to have that functionality available. Um, in general, this idea of the flexible plugins, I think it's an interesting one. Um, I don't know if, if um, uh, 
cross as anything like that, but um, if it does, I think it, it's not such a bad thing to, to have because, uh, again, being, being able at runtime to load different protocols, different plugins is a useful feature. Um, since I don't have that much time, I'll go to just one um, little more complicated example. Here, we went through also a bunch of uh, um, systems um, to develop the low-level code of the robot automatically. So we're using uh, Simulink and the MATLAB software to automatically generate all the, um, the firmware for the microcontroller-based uh, cards that move the robot. Here I'm showing this because it's probably the most complicated experiment that we put together is the tail operation system. We were, uh, in this case, running a humanoid walking in a museum in Venice while the controlling the person controlling the robot was uh, sitting in Genoa, so some 500 kilometers distance, and um, seeing feedback, visual, but also tactile, and um, force feedback through uh, exoskeleton and number sensors and whatever, a sensorized suit that the person is using um, remotely. So this is uh, uh, showing complicated enough behavior uh, where um, all that, uh, what I presented plus the low level have been put together, uh, designed in a reasonably uh, reusable way and modularized way. The last piece using Simulink I think is nice and important because it allows, um, allows for, um, uh, uh, you know, it's automatic code generation. It's very safe to, to design the controllers and just compile and plug them. Okay, um, that's it. Um, hope you enjoyed the presentation. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take to take them.